I need to copy this pair of white jeans, make a pattern from it, and then sew up a super stylish lime green faux suede pair of pants from that new pattern. How am I going to do that? I'll show you how. My client got this really nice lime green faux suede. And like I said, we need to copy this pair of pants. The client just loves this pair of white jeans with its flared legs, fitted thighs, and all this fun detail with side zipper. Besides that, we think we're going to make some minor size adjustments and she'd like to do the detail of perhaps a lace-up side vent. Now, important detail, my friends. The jeans have 2% lycra stretch to them. The suede does not. So can we even still do this? Stay tuned and let's get started pattern making. Now, lots of tutorials reveal how you simply lay the pants on the fabric and trace around it. Yes, you can do that, but I'm going to show you a more exacting method, truly professional. What you really need to do is copy one leg front and back. So I'm going to take this plain piece of muslin and instead of laying the pants on the muslin and tracing around it, instead I'll place the muslin over the pants. What I'll start doing now is pinning an outline of everything. Take pins, feel for the seam ridge, and starting anywhere, grab a pin and place it along that ridge. And you're pinning through the muslin and the pants. Here's a closer look. See how I nailed it right on the ridge. Keep doing that. As many pins as it takes. until you're all the way around. So why are we all of a sudden talking about copying onto muslin when we're supposed to be copying onto the faux suede? And by the way, what's muslin? We're copying onto inexpensive cotton woven muslin because it's the perfect cloth for patterning. We need to get this right and simply tracing onto the good stuff without working out bugs on the cheap stuff is shortcut, but not necessarily smart. That means having perfected an inexpensive copy first, then we'll have the confidence to use it on the more expensive, luxurious faux suede. As you get up to the crotch, and the all-important corner here, where we're going to turn a 90 degree angle pretty much, Go ahead and feel for your ridge, which is the seam line, and turn that corner. Making sure all the fabric stays smooth, keep going. Place as many pins as you need, probably a lot of them. We're almost to the waistband, and we'll make the waistband a separate piece so that when we get up here, we'll be following this ridge below the waistband across and back over to where we started in the beginning. There now, see how the entire front piece is all copied with pins. And since a front piece is often smaller than a back piece, that's another reason why we're copying in this manner rather than just tracing, as is often seen. Now all I have to do is make pencil marks or some kind of mark over each hump of the pin so that when I remove the pins, I'll have a dashed line to follow for cutout, except not quite. 
By not quite, I simply mean that there are other details to mark once we've marked the humps over the pins here. So I'm going along with my pencil and we still have button detail to mark, M detail to mark, extra flare, and thigh width to mark. See how I've marked the button placket? Now I have no intention of making true buttonholes. They'll be full or they won't exist at all and we'll just put buttons on. We'll have to see. Nevertheless, I drew the outline and made sure it's all marked. Now I can take all these pins off. I'll remove the muslin. Set aside the jeans. Lay the pattern out flat. Make a straight edge and start connecting dots. Intuitively, meaning by guess and by golly, I added extra flare from the knee down. Made sure I added a two and a half inch hem. After lengthening the pants the one inch, then adding the two and a half on. Looks like I just barely made it on the fabric. And finally, I needed to add a little extra in the thigh, which I chose to do on the inner aspect of the thigh. Half an inch. But wait, there's still more. I need to add, all the way around, except for the hem here at the bottom, 5 8 inch seam allowance. And even before adding seam allowances, I still had to add a 16 inch flap extension on the outer calf, which is a cell facing that will fold back because we intend to punch holes, place grommets, and then lace this suede lacing through the grommets and that all needs to be supported by extra fabric. I think that's everything now and this is another good reason why you do it on muslin first so that you take your time and really think through all the details. I do believe we're complete now. So I'll take my pinking shears and cut around all the outside most edges. That's because this fabric really frays. Pinking shears it is. Finished at last. Now repeat all that you learned on the back side. Patterning the back side is a different animal. That's because, remember, the back piece is larger than the front might find yourself placing the jeans inside of the muslin and sculpting the muslin to the pants such that when you're finished you've got kind of a 3D effect here of your pin job. All the while keeping everything smooth and well outlined. You can do this, it's just a little more challenging than the front piece. Okay, here's the first sample. And you'll notice each leg is a different material, that's just because I didn't have enough of each sample material. So, did the pants fit? I mean, that's the thing we've been waiting to find out all along, isn't it? No, they did not. There was a gap of about two inches that she just couldn't zip up. So what that tells us is this. We can copy exactly when working with like or similar fabric. That means match woven non-stretch to woven non-stretch and stretch to stretch. We can't copy exactly when working from stretch fabric to non-stretch, which is the situation we're in right now. Allowances will have to be made in the direction of larger pattern pieces. We can't copy exactly when working from non-stretch to stretch. In this situation, possibly, allowances can be made in the direction of smaller pattern pieces. Keep these three general rules of thumb in mind when copying garments and you'll do well. Otherwise, client was absolutely thrilled with the way the legs are turning out and their length. So 
it'll be a quick and easy job now for me to tear all this down because I'm used to that kind of thing and it will be worth it to make another new pattern before advancing on to the true green faux suede. Here's the second pair of sample pants. They look so great on her, which means the pattern is now perfected and we can tear this down to lay out on the green faux suede. Let's compare the old pattern to the new one. Looking closely, you'll see we added a good half an inch to the inner thigh, virtually nothing to the front seam, except right up here at the waist. We added a little bit in and a good half inch to five eighths inch on top of the waist. Over here in the hip area, I added a good three quarters inch because I need to have enough for that side zipper. Then we came down to about five eighths inch when we get to the knee. Everything is great at the self facing. Over on the other side of the knee, we simply tapered in to the original flare because everything's great with the flare. Pretty much the same for the back piece. We added a substantial one inch to the waist, about the same amount of 5 eighths inch along the outer thigh, blending into the self facing. At the center back seam right here, we did add a good half inch. And then on the inner thigh, starting at 5 eighths inch, tapering down to about a half an inch, and then finally into the flare. I can hardly wait to get over to the green faux suede with these perfected pattern pieces.